Hello, welcome to number seven, Ministries Christian Outreach. Today I'm going to be sharing my personal testimony of what it took for me to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and what it took from God to change me from the evil, corrupt, criminal lifestyle that I was engaged in for most of my life. I'm going to read Revelations chapter 12, verse 11, and it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And this is what we need to do, is we need to be bold through Jesus Christ, and we need to not give the devil any ground over us, and we need to be uh, brave and share our testimony of what Jesus Christ has brought us through and where he's brought us from so that he could be glorified and that we don't need to glorify ourselves and make ourselves to be something special that we're not. We're special in God's eyes, but outside of God, what are we? We're dirt. We were created from dirt and we're going to be returned to dirt. But what's going to make us special is that when we're glorifying Jesus Christ in our life, and that is my goal is to glorify Jesus Christ in my life, not draw people to myself, but point people to Jesus Christ because he's the only person that has helped me. When I grew up, I grew up in an atheist home. My mom was an alcoholic and she married three different husbands and the way the stepfather treated me, he didn't treat me like his own child. He treated me like a stepchild, if you know what I mean. He would hug and uh, tell that his children that he loved them. He would buy them gifts in front of me, but he would not buy me gifts. He treated us partial. And I understand that when you get into that type of situation, it's extremely challenging to love someone that's not your flesh and blood from another man. But this is what happened. and. Through a process of being pre-programmed and trained as a child to be an atheist because that's what he was. He was an atheist and that's how he raised us to be atheists. My mom was an alcoholic and she really didn't have any uh, views or opinions on God. We never prayed. They never took me to church. They actually made, they told me and encouraged me to make fun of Christians, make fun of people who believe in God, make fun of people who pray, and just mock God in general. And that's how I grew up. And when I was a child, when I was younger, uh, into my younger years, um, probably about seven or eight years old, I went to a kindergarten school, and I remember I had a black teacher, and I was one of the only white kids in her class, and she would smack me, and she would choke me, and punch me, and abuse me for about six months, and eventually got to the point where I was afraid to go to school and she was extremely racist towards white kids. And I grew up in a predominantly uh, black neighborhood and she had a field day with me when I came into her class. And I remember as a child not understanding why she would smack me or ch uh, choke me because I was kind of a quiet child uh, when I was in kindergarten. I don't remember being uh, like an obnoxious child or anything like that. And I, it confused me as to why it was happening. But I was scared. I was afraid to go to school anymore. My mom ended up uh, pulling out of me what would happen because I remember the teacher said that if I told anyone what she was doing, that she was going to beat me even worse. And she would literally just hold me by my neck and choke me and smack me. And it just, it went on for a very long time. And eventually my mom ended up finding out. She went to the principal, told the principal what was happening. And I guess the principal received other reports from other uh, white kids' mothers that this uh, teacher was abusing the white kids. So the teacher ended up getting fired. And I remember that left this uh, scar in my memory of being abused and discriminated for being white. And... Um, through growing up as a child with my brother, I remember me and my brother would always do all kinds of uh, just uh, little petty things like we would egg houses, we would uh, break into cars and uh, break windows and uh, toilet paper people's houses, just mischievous, just getting into trouble, nothing really extreme uh, when I was a child. But as I got to the age of 15 years old, I remember my brother extremely pressuring me to do drugs with him. And I remember telling him, no, I don't want to do drugs. And for about an hour, my brother was just constantly trying to manipulate me and persuade me and get me to do the drugs. And I literally remember telling him no over and over and over and over. And finally, he said, well, just come into my room and watch me get high, watch me smoke uh, weed. So I agreed to do that. I went into his house and he smoked weed in front of me and I remember the smell was so nasty and it just it, I didn't have any interest in doing it 
But what happened is I eventually gave in. He gave me the weed and said, uh, uh, just uh, inhale it and hold it, hold your breath and uh, just hold it as long as you can. I remember doing it. I remember choking violently and my mom woke up and she banged on the door and said, what are you guys doing? She could smell the weed. And my brother swore and cussed at my mom. And my mom, I believe, was afraid of my brother. And there was no order in the household. And my brother was swearing at my mom. My mom ended up leaving. And what happened is I got high for the first time. And I remember being so high that I felt like my actual physical body was floating on top of the ceiling. It was so intense. And I was always uh, seeking after that feeling, that escape from reality, so just from being made fun of uh, in school, from being rejected by my stepfather, from my mom being an alcoholic. Just I had all types of excuses and reasons and uh, uh, reasoning why I should get high all the time. And when I got high, what happened is, is like this new identity came on me or over me or in me and what happened is i found myself being accepted in groups of people just by doing drugs alone it no longer mattered what i looked like it didn't matter about the clothes that i wear just the fact that i did drugs i was accepted to this huge group of people and i remember loving it but aside from that i just loved the actual feeling of being high because it was a way for me to diagnose myself it was a way for me to cope with all the pain and just to escape from reality I was not enjoying the life that I was living I was extremely miserable and I would use drugs to comfort me and to make it from day to day and I got so addicted to it that I was I was high more than I was actually sober and from doing marijuana I got into doing magic mushrooms which is a hallucinogen which makes you see things I did PCP I smoked crack I did acid uh, almost every other day I did acid and I remember being taking uh, 10 hits of acid and being so high on the acid. Now, mind you, if you take a quarter of one hit of acid, you will literally trip. You'll be high for eight hours. I took 10 whole hits of acid. I got to the point where I actually literally forgot what my name was. I forgot who I was. I actually had to go through my own wallet and look at my driver's license to remember what my name was. My brain was so fried and so burnt out from the drugs that it is a miracle I was not permanently brain dead. And just there were times where I would be tripping and I would see demons uh, uh, trying to attack me and kill me and I remember blacking out one time and punching a brick wall with all my might and I remember looking at my knuckles and there was blood and tissue from my knuckles all shredded and I remember two of my friends grabbing me from behind and trying to stop me from punching this brick wall I didn't even know what I was doing and this was my lifestyle is just getting high and uh, doing all the drugs that I could and I really just lost a uh, a motivation for life in general. I didn't care about anything. I didn't care about school. I ended up uh, failing uh, high school three times in a row. I ended up dropping out of high school. And all I was trying to do was get money for drugs. I ended up losing my job that I was working at for two years. And the drugs just consumed my life. I was completely obsessed with it. And there was a time where I started breaking into people's houses to get money for drugs. There was a time where I was running around with a gun and a loaded gun shooting up people's houses for fun because I was bored, uh, stealing cop cars, smoking weed out of the Bible with words on it. I was an atheist and I used to make fun of Christians. I used to smoke weed out of the Bible with the words on it and mock God as if he was not real. And there was a time where I went into a movie theater and I was planning on stealing a lady's purse, preferably an old lady. But what happened is when I stole the lady's purse, her purse was strapped all the way around her arm. And when I grabbed the purse, I grabbed it with all my might and it broke two of her fingers. And I didn't purposely try to break this old lady's fingers. I was just trying to get the money, get the purse. And so it was in the newspaper that this 16-year-old uh, uh, child has uh, uh, stole this lady's purse and broke her fingers for drugs. 
and they locked me up. They put me in a detention center, uh, a, not a detention center, a prison for juveniles. It's called DYS, Department of Youth Services. It was Indian River, and it was one of the most violent places that I've ever been in. I had to fight literally every single day in this place, and it got to the point where fighting was actually normal. I remember my mom coming to visit me, and I lifted up my shirt, and I had bruises all up and down my chest, all up and down my body, it just punch, punch mark bruises from all the fights that I was in, and it was just a normal lifestyle. But I remember after I got out of uh, Indian River, the, the prison for juveniles, I made an agreement that I was never going to do drugs ever again. And I didn't do those type of drugs ever again. I ended up getting into uh, uh, sex with women. And I was 18 years old the first time that I committed fornication and adultery. And the moment that I gave up the drugs and alcohol, I was consumed with this other new lifestyle of having sex. I also realized that if you have uh, portray yourself as an image of a ladies man or a pimp or a player, you're also welcomed into a whole group of people. And I believe now that the devil, he doesn't care what addiction you have, as long as he has one type of stronghold, he doesn't need more than one. He just needs one. And he doesn't care which one it is. And so I just gave myself to women and to sex. I went to strip clubs. Two of my ex uh, two of my ex girlfriends were strippers. I got into uh, pornography. I got into uh, just consumed with women. I would meet a woman for the first day. We would have sex after the first day of meeting, and like I said, it just consumed me. And it was so important to me to be with a woman. But what happened is that was the thing that really, really messed me up. I ended up uh, becoming a drug dealer. I ended up doing steroids. I remember just being extremely angry. I had a hard heart. And I remember going through eight years without crying one time and just going from woman to woman. I was living with my son's mom for maybe five years, six years. And I was cheating on her with all these different women. And eventually I was driving with this one woman who I got pulled over in the car with. And the police officer asked me, the police officer asked me what my address was, what my name was, license registration, and what my phone number was. But I knew that the girl that was sitting next to me in the car was going to listen to what my phone number was so that she could track the phone number and call and tell my son's mom I was cheating on her with her. But what happened is I knew that was going to happen, so I gave the police officer my mom's old, uh, expired, disconnected phone number. But what happened is the girl that was in the car with me, she ended up uh, tracing the phone number that I gave to my mom's new phone number. She paid money to the operator, told my mom that I was cheating on my son's mom with her and possibly other women, which I was. And so my, my mom called my son's mom and told her what happened. Immediately, my son's mom kicked me out of the apartment. I had a little post-it note that was on the door. And I had this little bag of stuff that she put outside the door. She said, you're no longer welcome here. I know what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. And I am moving in with this other uh, woman. And at that time that I moved in with another girl, I had two parole officers for different crimes that I had committed. I had broken into people's houses. I had uh, robbed people, uh, assault, all kinds of charges. And I've been to four different prisons and just living a lifestyle of crime. Money was very important to me. I was a drug dealer. I, uh, I, I didn't use illegal drugs, but I sold them. And what happened is when I moved in with this girl, this girl was obsessed with me. I had used her previously when I went to prison for collect calls. She would send me money, money when I was in uh, prison. And I told her, promised her that when I got out, I was going to be with her. But when I got out, I lied. I ignored her. I didn't deal with her until whenever I wanted her. But I ended up moving in with this girl, not my son's mom, this other girl. And um, I don't use names because I, names are not important. 
it's the story or the principle that's important. So I moved in with this girl and this girl was wrapped around my finger. For three months, I, I lived there for free rent. She paid for my car insurance, paid for the gas, bought me clothes, bought me jewelry, uh, just gave me money and I was using her for sex. And I treated her so poorly. I never hit her. Actually, I never hit a woman ever in my life. But um, I was using this woman and uh, she was paying for everything. And I realized you could only treat a woman like this for so long. I would come home with hickeys on my neck. I would talk to other women on the cell phone and tell them that I loved them, but I would not tell this girl that I was living with that I loved her. I almost had sex with her best friend in front of her in the same bed, and they almost got into a fight over that. I was just really pushing this woman to her limits. And there were people around me that were warning me, and these warnings were coming from all kinds of people. And what they were telling me is leave that woman alone. At least tell her that you love her so she doesn't go crazy or leave her alone. She's a, she's getting ready to do something crazy and you're going to regret it. And all these people that were warning me were people that they had like AIDS and herpes and just they were prostitutes. They were warning me just people, men that I would go to clubs with, they would beat up women at the club, kick the women in the head, beat up people uh, after five minutes of being in a, or five minutes of being in a club, they would be getting in a fight, they would smack people in the face for no reason, flip over tables, and uh, this is the lifestyle that I was living, and these people were warning me, telling me to leave, that th leave this woman alone because something bad is going to happen so I didn't listen to them because of I was looking at them, their type of lifestyle, and they were trying to give me moral advice on what to do. I just absolutely did not listen to anything that they were saying as far as morally uh, ad advice. And so, like I said, I was living with this woman. The woman was wrapped around my finger, and I pushed her to her limits. There was a time where I was shaving my head in the bathroom. I was getting ready to go to a club, and... This woman knocked on the door. I let her in in the bathroom door and she was telling me about bringing this guy home and she said that I'm going to bring him home and she's asking me if I cared. She said that she was going to have sex with him and she was trying to provoke me to jealousy. She was trying to get some type of reaction from me to see if I cared about her at all and I didn't give her any reaction. I told her we're just friends. Whatever you do, that's between you and him. I don't care. Help yourself. Do what you want to do. And it, she got so mad and silently mad. She got so mad and upset. She went into the refrigerator and started drinking beers. She normally did not drink alcohol. And so something told me just to stay home until things smoothed over and don't leave. But I ended up leaving anyways because I wanted to go meet more women at the club and go back to my son's mom and have sex with her, which is what I did. I went to the club, m met more women at the club, went to uh, my son's mom's house had sex with her and then I went over to my friend's house and I got a phone call from a strange number and I answered the phone and the person said who is this and I said well who is this you called my cell phone why are you asking me who is this and I hung up on him and the person called back and said who is this I hung up again then I got another phone call from my son's mom and I was thinking that this guy that was calling was a guy that was uh, messing around with my son's mom so what happened was my son's mom called me and she told me that there was a detective that just came to her house with a warrant for my arrest. And I said, well, what is the warrant for? And I'm thinking I'm involved in all kinds of stuff. At the time when she told me this, I already had two parole officers. I was selling drugs. I was committing crimes routinely. I was just living a lifestyle of a crime. And again, I had two parole officers when she's telling me this and I'm thinking, now what? Now what? And she said, well, someone said that you raped her. And I'm thinking, I'm not worried at this point when they tell me that uh, someone said that I raped them. I figured it was a mistaken identity, mistaken name. As soon as they saw me, everything would get clear and everything would work itself out. So I'm actually not even, I'm actually relieved 
when I hear this. I figure as soon as I go to the police station, they'll take one look at me, figure, oh, we got the wrong person and we'll let this person go. But that's not what happened. So anyway, she said that she told the detectives that it wasn't possible. I didn't rape anyone. She knows me. I would not do that sort of thing. Especially back then, I had this... Uh, this image, this uh, identity that I was a player, that I was a pimp, that I was a, a, a ladies man, a womanizer, that I would never need to do that sort of thing. And um, so anyhow, I called the detectives back and I said, look, I'll come down to the police station in a few minutes. Can you tell me who said that I raped her? And they said, well, we can't share that information with you, but you have to come down to the police station and we'll talk about it. So I called all the different women that I was uh, fornicating with. And I asked them, do you know anything about someone saying that I raped them? And nobody said that they knew anything about it. And they said, that's messed up, but if we find anything out, we'll let you know. I called all the different women except for the woman that I was living with. Because it never even came into my mind or thought that she was the one that said that. I never even considered it. And I went down to the police station and they said, um, they said, uh, they said, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used you against you in a court of law. They put the handcuffs on me, read the Miranda rights to me, and shipped me to the city jail. And when I got there, they said um, who it was. They said the girl's name. I said, that's crazy. I live with that girl. And I pulled out a key to the apartment, and they said, well, that's not what she said. And I want to tell you that you're looking at... 45 years to double life you're looking at eight counts of felonies 2f1 rapes 2f2 kidnappings 2f3 gross uh, or intimidation 2f5 uh, gross sexual imposition it was like eight felonies two of them were f1s and i was 45 years to double life in prison that i was looking at and i already had two parole officers before this and i'm thinking still it's no big deal. They're going to they're gonna let me go. They're going to figure out it was a mistake or it was a lie. It's not true. Or the girl who I was living with who lied on me, I figure she's going to fess up and admit that she lied and everything's going to work itself out. Didn't work that way. They ended up setting my bail at a quarter of a million of dollars, quarter million dollars, $250,000. And the felony charges remained. They stayed where they were. And I was in the county jail for about 10 months. And what happened to me is the reality of what was taking place has started to dawn on me. Meanwhile, my son's mom came to visit me to tell me that she was having sex with my best friend. So that started to bother me. And then the lawyers, I ended up giving them my brand new paid for Ford Explorer to represent me, the lawyer ended up taking my Ford Explorer and leaving. And then I had another lawyer who took all the money in my bank account and left. And then my family members got rid of all my stuff, my computer, they stole my jewelry. The girl that I was living with got rid of all my clothes. I was a union carpenter, I lost my job. Being a drug dealer, I lost all my connections. All the women that I was messing around with, they all turned their back on me. My family didn't come to visit me, they turned their back on me. Everyone turned their back on me. Meanwhile, I still have two parole officers from previous crimes, and I'm looking at 45 years to double life. And at this point in time, I realized that there was no hope for me. It finally dawned on me the reality of what I was looking at. I realized my situation of looking at 45 years to double life for a rape I did not commit. And I looked at my criminal record of my past and I realized I had no lawyers. And I realized that there was no hope for me. And I no longer wanted to live. The pain that was on me was so great that my face actually started to sag from depression. I no longer wanted to live. In fact, I wanted to die. I, I needed to die. The thought of death was like a comfortable pillow to me. And so what happened is while I was at the jail, I planned on killing myself. I ended up saving up money, any, uh, not money, uh, medicine. I saved up antidepressant medicine so that I could overdose on the pills and then I could kill myself and I was going to, at the same time while I overdosed on the pills, I was going to take sheets and wrap them around my neck and around the bars and I was going to hang myself. 
and I was determined to kill myself. I mean, there was no questions about it. I literally saw no future for myself. I figured that the court system is not going to believe me, knowing where I came from, knowing my past, looking at two parole officers. And the, the police officers, when they arrested me, they never asked my side of the story before they got warrants for my arrest. They strictly went off of this girl's word. They did a rape kit test on her. The rape kit... Uh, showed that there was no signs of her being raped. There was no signs of a forced entry. There was no scratches. There were no bruises. Her eyes weren't dilated. All the little things that they do, I actually don't know all the details. I just know a few things. But it all pointed to the woman was not raped. But even then, they still arrested me for these charges. And everyone in the jail were telling me, look, man, you need to take this serious. Your life is at stake. And it finally, finally just caught me and it was so much of a burden for me to realize that there was no hope for me. I didn't have a lawyer anymore. I didn't have um, any type of faith in God. I was an atheist and I figured that if God was real, he hated me because I used to smoke weed out of Bible paper. I broke old ladies' fingers. I stole cop cars, shot up people's houses. I had two babies killed from abortion. I had lived a lifestyle of wickedness and evilness why, if God was real, why would he ever love me or care about me or help me in any way, shape or form? So I decided to kill myself. That was it. It was determination that I needed to die. And I remember going to this older black Muslim guy and I told him what happened to him. I told him what happened to me. I said I was living with this girl and I was using her, coming home with hickeys on my neck, taking advantage of her. And she got sick of the way I was treating her. She lied on me and said that I raped her. And the Muslim man said, I've been locked up many years. I know when someone's lying to me and I know when someone's telling me the truth, but I believe that you're telling the truth and what you need to do is get right with God, whoever you know him to be, fight for your life, stop taking that medicine and get right with God, whoever you know him to be, fight for your case and fight for your life. And I listened to what this man told me, but I, I realized that I didn't know God. And again, I believe that if God was real, he hated me. And I didn't care. I didn't believe in demons. I didn't believe in God, the Bible, church, any of that. And so what happened is I went into the jail cell determined to kill myself. And the way that I was locked up is when I went into the jail cell, all the inmates came out. And when I came out of the jail cell, all the inmates got locked up. I was in phone restriction and segregation. They separated me. Um, and so what happened is I went into the jail cell and I slammed the door behind me and I was getting ready to kill myself at this moment. But what happened to me was the heaviness, the burden of all this pain. It, it was like I had the world on top of my shoulders and this heaviness, it was overtaking me. Like I said, my face was sagging from the depression, from the, 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 the hopelessness. And I actually even lost anger. I, I didn't even have enough energy or strength to have anger. I just fell down to my knees involuntarily in a jail cell after I slammed the door behind me and tears started pouring out of my eyes. I'm talking about pouring out of my eyes. And I remember looking up at the air and I said, God, if you're real, you help me right now. And if you don't help me, I will kill myself right now. You know I did not do this. You know I did not rape this woman. And if you help me right now, I will serve you the rest of my life or you can kill me dead. And I meant it with all my heart. This was no, I wasn't in church. There was no pastor. There was no religious stuff. This was in a jail cell. And I'm looking at 45 years to double life and I'm getting ready to kill myself and I'm crying on the floor and I'm saying, God, you help me right now or I'm going to kill myself. And I meant it. I wasn't playing no games at all. And I got up and I remember seeing a Bible in the jail cell that someone else left behind. And I opened up the Bible and it opened up to Genesis chapter 39. I saw my name, Joseph, in the Bible. And I thought, wow, what a coincidence. And I read Genesis chapter 39. It was about the story of Joseph 
who was falsely accused of rape and thrown into prison by Potiphar's wife. And immediately I realized that's exactly what's going on with me. My name's Joseph. I was falsely accused of rape and thrown into prison. Not by Potiphar's wife, but I was thrown into prison. The, sim the situation was way way too similar and it blew my mind but this is what happened all the the depression all the need to die the wanting to commit suicide everything left me i mean all this burden this weight it all left me supernaturally and what happened is god's presence actually came into the jail cell all the hairs on my body on my arm stood straight up and what happened is i felt this love and this peace and this joy and it can consumed me. This love and this peace and joy consumed me. I no longer was upset. I no longer was angry. I no longer was depressed. I was just consumed with God's love and his peace and his joy. And I ended up leaving that jail cell with a joker smile on my face. My situation remained the same, but I didn't. God actually showed me that he was real. And when I realized that God was real for the first time and that he had a plan for me and that he loved me and he cared about me, it changed the way that I saw life. I mean, the way I thought was different. My situation of looking at 45 years to double life, it became so small. And the reality of God being real, the reality of eternity, the reality of God loving me became so big, it became more important that I couldn't even care about what happened with me looking at 45 years to double life. The correction officers looked at me and they thought I was crazy because I was walking around with this huge joker smile and this peace and I literally did not have a care in the world. I was bouncing. But what happened is God started giving me supernatural gifts, things that I didn't even believe on. I started prophesying things would come to pass immediately after I spoke them. There was an inmate who grew up in a city that I didn't grow up in and he had a stack of pictures of people that I didn't know. We got halfway into the stack. God told me that that person that was in the picture died and I told him God told me the person that was in that picture died immediately he started crying. He said, how did you know that? I said, God told me. God showed me. God started doing all these supernatural things through me, things I didn't even believe in. I didn't believe in demons. I didn't believe in spirits. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in heaven or hell, nothing. But God was proving himself to me. He started giving me visions, dreams, uh, spiritual gifts. I started preaching and speaking Bible verses before I ever even read them. And God made himself so known to me that it consumed my life. And what happened is I ended up accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I ended up forgiving the girl who lied on me. I forgave my family members for hurting me. All the people who did me wrong in my life, I forgave everyone. And I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me for all of my sins. And I pled the blood of Jesus Christ over my sins. I got saved. God filled me with the Holy Spirit and he changed my entire life. The woman that lied on me, she ended up coming to visit me while I was in the jail eight different times. She ended up sending uh, money to my commissary. She wrote me letters and sent me pictures of sexual objects. And what happened is she tried to drop the charges, but the prosecutor said that if she drops the charges, then they will arrest her for falsely accusing me. And she ended up sticking to her story. She offered to uh, leave the state, but they said, if you do that, we're going to put a warrant for your arrest. And she ended up continuing pursuing the case. But what happened is the girl came to visit me in the jail eight different times. And so the 45 years to double life, they ended up... Um, giving me a plea bargain of six months time served. I ended up getting mad when they offered me a plea bargain of six months time served because it let me know that the justice center or the justice system knew that I was innocent because they would not have offered someone who's looking at 45 years to double life two F1 felony counts of rape. They're not gonna offer that person six months so they could go out and rape more people. It showed me that they knew I was innocent, but they didn't want to be liable or vulnerable for a lawsuit because I was even threatening to sue them if they didn't drop all the charges. So they didn't drop the charges because they wanted to have something that I could plead guilty to so they could justify keeping me in there. 
But the emphasis of the story is not that I was in prison for something I didn't do because there was a lot of crimes and things that I did commit that I never got caught for. The emphasis is that it took this to happen to me to get me to God. It was a blessing that this happened. It was the best thing that ever happened to me because it's what encouraged me to go to consider Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was my absolute last choice in life. I tried everything in life and everything failed me. Nothing filled the void in my heart. Nothing satisfied me except for Jesus Christ. Everything else would just leave me empty and wanting more and more and more, never truly satisfying me supernaturally. So what happened is um, I just uh, started going to all these court cases and they were trying to make the plea bargains. And then what happened is the judge started Started doing illegal things he actually tried to force me to represent myself and when I saw what he said I didn't realize that he was doing anything illegally until I looked at the stenographer in the court and I saw the stenographer in the court her jaw dropped and her head went back and her eyes got real big when the judge said I'm gonna force you to represent yourself without a lawyer and you're not gonna tell the jurors that you've been denied your right to an attorney. But what happened is even though I was in this situation, at this time I had the power of God flowing through me. So instead of me being scared and uh, afraid of the judge in the situation, I actually felt like I had the judge in the palm of my hand. And while I felt that way, I had chains around my waist, I had handcuffs, I had shackles on my ankles, I was in an orange jumpsuit, I had an extensive criminal record, I had no lawyer representing me, I had a judge who was trying to force me to represent myself, and I had pure peace and joy. I actually believe that I know what Jesus felt like when he said that you have no power over me but what my Father in heaven has given you. And I felt that I had the judge in the palm of my hand. This doesn't make any sense in the natural. It was a spiritual experience that God allowed me to have. And I felt that I had full control over the judge rather than him having full court control over me. But what happened is the judge ended up sending me to a mental institution. And when I got to the mental institution, they sent me there under a fake name. They gave me the name Ralph, which my name was Joseph. And they ended up giving me uh, food trays with the name Ralph on it. And I told them when I got to the intake, they said, what's your name? I said, my name's Joseph. They looked at the, the, uh, the, um, the report or the documents of me. They said, well, we got you down as Ralph. And I told them again, I said, my name's Joseph. They said, well, we're looking at the file right here. We got you down as Ralph. At that point in time, I didn't argue with them. I agree with them. I said, okay, my name's Ralph. And what they did is they put case closed on the court documents. They put case closed and they sent me to a mental institution under a fake name. I don't know how that goes over with you, but it did not go over well with me. My grandmother ended up paying $2,000 for me to get a good lawyer. This lawyer ended up fighting for me. He filed a bunch of motions to dismiss the uh, charges in the case. The prosecutors would not budge. They ended up making a plea bargain with me of a felony five of two years time served. And uh, the lawyer, he said, this is the case. He said, you can... Plead guilty to this felony five and do two years of prison or you can risk the judge not accepting any of the evidence. Even though you have exhibit A through Z does not guarantee the judge is going to allow the exhibits into the courtroom. And it doesn't mean that it's going to guarantee go to the juror's eyes. So that means that when the girl is coming to visit me, it doesn't mean that the the lawyers or the prosecutors were ever going to share that information with the jurors. And when he told me that and explained it to me like that, and he said, you're gambling with your entire life, just do the two years and move on with your life. When he explained it to me like that, I said, okay, I, I, I believe that you have my good intentions at hand and you're going to... Uh, you know, look out for me. So I ended up pleading guilty to a felony five and it, it was like a scar on my heart, heart. It made me feel so bad, but I ended up doing it anyways. And what happened is I believe that if I would have got out of jail or prison at that moment, 
that it would have destroyed me. I wasn't just yet ready to be released. Even though God filled me with the Holy Spirit, even though God changed me and showed me these great things and was using me, I still, I mean, I was still smoking. I was st in, in jail, in prison. I was smoking. I was still swearing. I was gambling, listening to rap music. God ended up purging these things from me. I stopped smoking uh, when I was in jail. I stopped swearing when I was in jail. I stopped uh, gambling. And God was just polishing me and just taking care of the rough edges and when I was in uh, jail I didn't have a GED I didn't have no high school diploma I could barely read I couldn't even do uh, 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 any type of multiplication or division I ended up getting my GED in prison I read the Bible for eight hours a day I went to the church services in the prison like nine times a week three times a day I was in the church choir in the prison and it was just consumed with God I didn't even feel like I was locked up I was so full of God's joy and love and peace. It didn't even matter truly where I was at. It didn't matter. And when they released me, I was like, okay, I'm just going to go in God. I even had, this is the Bible that I had with me when I was in prison. I actually carried this Bible with me outside of the prison. I had it in my hand when they released me from prison. And I've not let this Bible go since then. I thank God for the word of God because it completely changed me. I ended up getting uh, two college degrees I ended up uh, getting even two medical license, which I'm not going to talk too much about that. And the miracle was that God took a person who was almost brain dead and could not even barely read a book to graduate with two college degrees, get a medical license. Um, and now God allowed me to be a pastor of a small Christian outreach. I go to the jails and the prisons, and every Sunday I do the church services at the jail. God just completely changed me, and I thank God for everything that he did. And I pray that this testimony blesses you, and I pray that it encourages you and it inspires you into the things of God. And remember, if God can take me from mud and purify me, he can do it with you. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.